All right, welcome my Z stars to a new video on chi-square tests for independence. So we've already learned about a chi-square test for goodness of fit. Now we're going to learn about a chi-square test for independence. It's actually really, really easy. It's one of the easiest tests I think there is. So as we discussed, there are only three types of chi-square tests. Goodness of fit, that's when there's only one variable. Homogeneity and independence. Well, this video is going to focus on independence. Now, an independence test would look something like this. First, there's got to be a two-way table because there has to be two variables. So if we look at this two-way table here, we're going to notice that on the left-hand side, we have, um, do you have a high school diploma? Yes or no? So that is categorical, right? The answer is the word. And then do you have a full-time job? Yes or no? Okay. So again, these are categorical variables. And there's two of them. The first question is, what's your high school diploma status? Do you have a high school diploma? Yes or no? Second variable is, do you have a full-time job? Yes or no? So what we're trying to see here is, is there independence between these two variables? Now, remember what independence means. Independence means that one variable does not impact the other. So having a diploma has no impact on having a full-time job or vice versa, or not having a diploma has no impact on having a full-time job. That's what we mean by saying we're independent. Now, um, the opposite of independent is no independence, which means there is an association. If there's no independence, that means there is an association and that having a high school diploma or not having a high school diploma has some type of impact on having a full-time job or not. So basically mean that these two variables are related. One affects the other. That's what that means when there is an association. So in a, in a test for independence, you are simply testing to see if there is evidence of an association between the two variables in the problem. So recall, an association means not independence. So these are really, really simple. We've actually been talking about independence since the very beginning of the, um, the course, but this is one where we can actually officially test for it. Now remember, you're always going to see some numbers. So we did a sample of 157 people. We asked them these two different questions, and this is the results of what we found. Now, obviously, we see some different numbers here. Just because we see different numbers doesn't mean there is an association. The numbers are naturally allowed to be off a little bit, but if they're off too much, then that's what could alert us that there is an association. So let's um, keep talking here. So there are four steps, like any other significance test. Step one is the hypothesis, and the null is always that there is independence which means no association. You don't have to have both. Some kids will write there is no association between X and Y. Other kids will say there is independence between X and Y. Saying independence versus saying no association is the exact same thing. So the null is that, you know, status quo. We believe that there is absolutely no association between these two variables. Having a high school diploma has no impact on your full-time job. The alternative is that the two variables are not independent. This means that there is an association. Your uh, having a high school diploma does impact having a full-time job or not. So they are related. All right, step two are the conditions. These are the same three conditions we talked about with the goodness of fit test. The first two are going to sound very familiar. The sample must be random to avoid bias. The sample size must be less than 10% of the population to assume independence. And there must be five or more expected counts in each category. So usually we say that first, but then in step three, we do have to go and find our expected counts. So in step three is the work. And the work involves building your model, assuming that there is no association, assuming that they are independent of each other. And to do that, we have to get our expected counts. The table, the chart that I showed you earlier, will give you the observed counts, we have to find the expecteds. And it's actually really, really easy, easy to do this. To find the expected counts, if there is no association, you simply take the row total, multiplied by the column total, divided by the grand total. And that may seem a little bit confusing, but when we actually do the work here in a second for a problem, you'll understand. Step four are our, is our conclusion. Here, this is a conclusion just like every other conclusion we've been doing. It's all going to be based on a p-value, and if your p-value is really, really low, you're going to reject an all and say there is evidence of an association because a really low p-value says that your data is very unlikely to occur, but it did occur, which means that there is evidence that the association is there and that the alternative is true. 
If your p-value is very large, then we're going to fail to reject the null and say that there is a lack of evidence to support an association. So if the p-value is really large, basically it says that our values that we're observing are actually quite likely to occur if there is an association. Or I'm sorry, if there is no association, if there is independence. So that's why if that happens, we're saying, well, listen, we, we just don't have the evidence to officially say there is an association. All right, um, now let's actually just jump to an example, because that's the easiest way you're going to learn how to do this. And by the end of this, I hope you're going to realize, like, wow, I like these guys score tests better than anything else we've been doing. So here's the question. Is there an association between earning a high school diploma and being employed full time for residents in this small town? So we're going to run a test at the 5% significance level. Remember that 5% level is our alpha level, so we're going to use an alpha level of 0.05. That is simply what we're going to compare our p-value to to help us make our decision. All right, now these numbers that we see here are the observed. We observed 52 people with the high school diploma and employed full-time, 30 no high school diploma and full-time, and then obviously the 40 and the 35. Those are the numbers that matter most to us. All these other numbers are simply the totals. We're concerned with the actual counts of our categories, and there are four categories because we have two for the first variable, two for the second variable. So there are a total of four categories. And these are just totals. The totals don't count as categories. All right, so um, how do we answer this question? Well, first we need our hypotheses. As I mentioned earlier, the null is that there is no association between earning a high school diploma and being employed full-time in this town. So um, you do have to add the context to that, but all words here, we're just saying there is no association. Come on. Having a high school diploma has no impact on having a full-time job or not. And the alternative is that, no, there is an association between earning a high school diploma and being employed full-time. You don't have to make any claim that if you have a high school diploma, you are more likely to have a full-time job. Nothing like that. You're just saying that these two variables are connected. All right, let's check those conditions real quick. The sample of 157 people must be selected randomly to avoid bias. Sorry, I forgot a space right there. The sample of 157 must be less than 10% of the town to assume independence. And there must be five or more expected counts in each category. And that piggybacks us right into the next step to actually find those expected counts. So as I mentioned earlier, the 52 is observed, the 30, the 40, the 35, those are observed. So how many people would we expect to see in this full-time diploma category if we did have independence. Like I mentioned, it's very easy. We're simply going to take the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. So I'm going to go to my calculator. I'm going to take 92 times 82 and divide it by 157. And that means I'm going to put 48.05 there. That means that we would expect 48.05 people to be in that category if there was truly no independence. Or I keep messing that up. I'm very sorry. If there was truly no association, which means independence. All right, now let's talk about employed full-time, did not earn a high school diploma. So for that one, we're going to do the row total 65 times the column total 82 divided by the grand total 157, and we get 33.95. And then I'm going to move on to not employed full-time high school diploma. Once again, row total, 92, times column total, 75, divided by 157, and that's 43.95. And I got one more to go here. For earning, a, uh, do not earn a high school diploma, not employed full-time, row total, 65, times column total, 75, divided by our grand total of 157. All right, we get 31.05. So the first thing I want to notice is that none of our numbers are really that far off. The grand totals are not that, or, or the expected values, excuse me, are not that far away from what we observed. So we understand that, you know, you know what's close? Are, are these numbers close enough? Maybe, maybe not. That's the whole point of doing a test, is to find out, because what you think may be close might not really be close. So I know these numbers do seem fairly close, but only significant tests like this will actually figure this out. So for each one of those four categories, please keep in mind there are only four categories because I have two variables by two variables, and each variable has two categories. So two categories by two categories, four different 
um, categories. And remember, the totals don't really count. Okay, keep that in mind. They don't count as categories. All right, so to find our chi-squared, we got to do the observed minus the expected, all squared, divided by the expected. And we have to do this for each category and then add them all together. So let's start with having a high school diploma employed full time. So we're going to do, I'm going to do it all at once. You need parentheses for that. So we have the observed minus expected. Oh, I erased it by accident. Sorry about that. The observed was 52 minus the expected 48.05 squared divided by the expected 48.05. All right, and we get 0.3247. So I'm going to write that number by down, 0.3247. All right, I'd actually advise you to go ahead and try these on your own with me just to make sure you're doing them correctly. So we're now going to do no high school diploma, but still employed full time. So we got 30 observed minus 33.95 expected squared divided by the expected. So this is the exact same formula that we use for the goodness of fit test, but it's just the problem that is a little bit different. So 0.4, actually I have it around to 0.46, if we rounded that correctly, 0.460 technically. All right, and let's keep going here. Um, high school diploma, not employed full time, 40 observed, minus 43.95 expected. Do not, number one mistake, kids forget to square, divided by the 43.95. And we get 0.355. And I got one more to go here. We're almost done. This goes pretty quick. All right, we get the observed. And again, this is no high school diploma, no full-time job. 35 observed minus 31.05 expected squared divided by the 31.05. And 0.502. All right, now I'm going to add all those together. So I'm going to take 0 0.3247 plus 0 0.460 plus 0.335 plus 0 0.507. And I get 1.6267. Now, if you need a calculator for that, you know, um, oh, actually, I messed that up. I apologize. Let me just show that work because it is very easy to mess up. So 0.3247 plus 0 0.460 plus 0.35. 5 plus 0.507. All right, and I got 1.6467. And that's my chi square value, 1.6467. Okay, you definitely need to show that. You don't have to show all the work for each of those, but you do have to write each of those down like I did and then get your total. So now we're going to need our p value. Now remember, chi-squared is a test statistic. It's just like a z-score or t-score, right? Very different in terms of how it's found, so please don't apply the same logic to them, but the very, very, it's the same idea as being a test statistic. So to get our p-value, remember, we're going to use chi-squared CDF. So we've, we've used normal CDF for z-scores, t-CDF for t-scores. Now we're going to use chi-squared CDF for chi-squared scores. You always have a positive chi-squared, so we're always going to start that at the value you got, 1.6467, we're going to go way up, 9999, nine, nine, nine. I don't know how many 9s you type in. Now, this is where we got to talk a little bit about degrees of freedom. If you remember, for goodness of fit, there's only one variable. So it has nothing to do with your sample size. It's how many categories you have. You did categories minus 1. So here, I have to be careful because this is a little different. So I have two categories across the top, two categories across the bottom. To find the degrees of freedom for this, you take your, um, your degrees of freedom across the top and multiply it by your degrees of freedom across the side, okay? So up top I have 2 minus 1, which is 1 degree of freedom across the top. On the side we also have 2 minus 1, which is 1 degree of a freedom across the side. Then you multiply those. So it's degrees of freedom times degrees of freedom. Um, kind of weird, but that is the formula for that, okay? So it's another one of those things you got to keep in mind. And 1 times 1 is 1. So we got um, 1 degree of freedom across the top, 2 categories, minus 1 is 1. Across the side there, yes, I have a high school diploma. No, I don't. 
two categories, minus one is one degree of freedom, one times one is one degree of freedom. So it's your degrees of freedom across the top, degrees of freedom across the side, times those together. And get a nice simple one in this case. All right, and I get 0.1994. Now remember, that's a very, very likely p-value, 0.1994. Now that conclusion is going to lead me to say fail to reject the null because a p-value of that, basically this p-value is about 20%, right? This means that the, my data, my observed data, happens 20% of the time, assuming that there is no association. So if there is no association, my data is pretty likely which means there probably is no association and that these two variables are independent and that I cannot go with the alternative. Remember, the alternative was there was an association. So my conclusion, and I'll scroll down a little bit here, will be since 0.1994 is less than 0.05, oh my goodness. I take pride in making mistakes in my videos. I just do it all the time, right? So since 0.1994 is greater than 0.05, I will fail to reject the null. Now I need the context. There is no evidence of an association. between having a diploma, having a high school diploma, and having a full-time job. Now, it's important to note that our numbers weren't exactly right. I mean, the, the expecteds didn't match up exactly with what I observed. But they're close enough that I can't officially say, oh, my goodness, if you have a high school diploma, you are more likely to have a uh, full-time job. No, I can't say that at all. The numbers aren't that far off. And my p-value led me to the conclusion that I'm going to fail to reject the norm, which means that I do not have evidence that there is an association. So I cannot say that these two variables are connected. So all I can say is that I have a lack of evidence of an association, and I'm going to have to stick with my alternative, or I'm sorry, I'm going to have to stick with my null in that these two variables are more than likely probably independent of each other, which means one is not affecting the other. But we word our conclusion by simply saying we fail to reject the null. I guess there is no evidence of an association. And, you know, this is only one example. Other examples might get a very, very small p-value. Now, a very, very small p-value would occur when your observes are very, very different than your expecteds. That's going to produce a very large chi-squared, which will produce a very, very low p-value. And in that case, that says your data is very, very unlikely. And if your data is very, very unlikely, then it means that you do have evidence that there is an association because that's what you're seeing in your data. So um, these problems are really simple. You know, the, the couple of things you just got to be careful of is finding those expected values, row total times column total divided by grand total, and you do need decimals there, um, even though that there are counts, you still need a couple decimals there. And the other thing is the degrees of freedom. So just make sure you understand that when you're working with chi-squared, degrees of freedom is categories minus one. So when we have two degrees of freedom, categories minus one across the top, categories minus one across the side, you multiply those together to get your overall degrees of freedom. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Hopefully you learned a lot. And I will say the trend has been that on AP tests, there really are a lot of chi-squared questions just like this pop up. Independence chi-squared is very, very common. If it's not on the extended response or the free response, it's probably going to be in a multiple choice of some type. Um, so please make sure you're aware of how to do these problems. All right, guys, enjoy.